you all for coming. A lot of familiar faces, so it's really nice. Uh, so we we're asking today in the U.S. war on terror, who are the real victims? And of course, the first victims are the innocent people who get uh, preemptively prosecuted, uh, entrapped, uh, put into solitary confinement usually before their trial. So I hope you all checked out our solitary confinement cell. Because that's the size they spend years in sometimes. And so we're going to make a lot of good speakers here today, but we are going to begin with some music. And our former choir director here, for 13 years here, the choir director, he's going he's to sing for us. And at the end, you all get a chance to sing. <laughs> I hope everyone will remember to put their cell phones on vibrate. Talk to them all over there because 
this has been a, a long, long struggle here, and it really began in this church with them. And we also have a hot and police here somewhere. And we're happy, very happy to have him here too. And so I'll, you know, it's kind of where it's nice to have a full house here. This is great. But I see we were Samuel there, he was a friend of this church before the and before he was arrested. So, and when he was arrested, this church was a, a really a big support for him. And most of the people here became supporters. And Friends of Human Rights, which our banners out there, was uh, actually formed in this church. And I see a lot of members here. And, uh, I, I'm not going to name them all because there's too many. <laughs> I'm happy to see them back here. And uh, uh, we've got other organizations represented, St. Pete for Peace. Uh, Reverend Bruce right here. Yeah. And, uh, and sponsors, of course, that are named on their program. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so when Sammy was arrested, they formed you know, Friends of Human Rights around his case. We went to the prison and had rallies. We went to the trial every day. We had people here that stood outside with a banner every Friday at the, during the trial for six months. So. And the last time we had so many Alarians in this building was when we were celebrating his acquittal by the jury. Uh, but as you know, that didn't get him out of jail. But, so now we're, you know, all charges against him were dropped in June, so we're celebrating that. <laughs> okay, I think, that's, I think that's all I intended to say here. And so now our first speaker is going to be now uh, Alari. I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> so. yeah, I'm so happy and so honored to be at this church. I will never forget the support, the love, the compassion we found from the people who come to the church from Mel, from Lois, from Fonda, from everybody. When my husband was arrested in 2003, it was a very dark time for us. And, you know, the community didn't know how to deal with it, and we felt lonely. We came to the church, and we used to do so many prayers, you know, especially that how, you know, how nice and sensitive they were towards our religion that they even chose a universal prayer, you know, to accommodate us and that was so beautiful. My kids loved loved coming here when they were so sad and lonely. So I will never forget that. I'm so grateful you are God sent Mel and everyone else here. And thank you for hosting us all this time, you know, my kids always my husband is so grateful to all of you. And this, you know, tells me that we should not give up as American Muslims. We should always have hope. We should always believe in the goodness of people. We should not isolate ourselves, you know. Because when my husband was arrested, if we were isolated as what the government wanted us to be, then we would have really lost. But we gained, through our suffering, through our struggle, we gained more supporters and more friends, and real friends at that time. Friends in need are friends indeed, as they say. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about things you might have heard from me before, which is, you know, what happens when a person is taken away from his family. My husband was arrested very early in the morning, my kids woke up to see and some of them like covering, not covering their faces, but they, they were wearing dark clothes and, you know, having flashlights pointed at my kids. One of them was 12, the other was 9. Uh, it was very scary to wake up to this scene, seeing their father, his hands. He was, uh, you know, put against the wall and his hands were being handcuffed. That's a scene that my children will never forget, of course. You know? And uh, we just have to le start living without a father, without a husband, for a number of years. And it wasn't easy. My husband was the sole breadwinner. He used to take care of you know, getting money, putting you know, food on the table. <laughs> and I had to take care of five kids. 
So for me, it wasn't easy at all. I had to also manage to find a good lawyer and uh, get money for that lawyer. We had to spend at least a million, over a million dollars for our case. So you can imagine the fear I had in my heart, like waking up in the morning, thinking of all the crazy charges against my husband that could have put him in jail for life. And the second thing I had to worry about is also the money to get to pay for the lawyers and to take care of my five kids and their mental state at that time, their emotions. It wasn't easy at all. One time my daughter came from, I had to take my daughter to a public school and that was like for a very painful reason. The community didn't know how to deal with the family of a political prisoner. They just wanted us to disappear, you know? So what did we do? I had to pull my kids out of the school that my husband established and put them in public schools in a completely foreign environment to them because they didn't have friends there. So it was even double, you know, the pain here. And one time my daughter came and said, a boy called me, you're the daughter of the terrorist and this and that. And yeah, it wasn't easy at all. And we had to go to a psychiatrist and sit with her and deal with, you know, the way our, the whole structure of our family was destroyed. We had to rebuild our life again. And then we had to deal with the visits to the prison. Seeing my husband opened my eyes to the cruelty of the prison system in America. How they deal with a very inhumane <coughs> way with the families, with the children, the wives, with the prisoners themselves. One time, I, when my husband was in the penitentiary, and that was pre-trial. He wasn't even convicted of anything. I, I had to deal with him like, you know, he was put in the prison section that dealt with uh, convicted criminals and murderers. So I had to go to drive from here all the way to Coleman for an hour at least, and then wait and wait and wait in a very small room so he could come and talk to me behind a glass partition, no touching, nothing, just talking to me. And he didn't show up. And after all these hours, I asked, what's happening? Where is my husband? He, they said to me, he refused to be strip searched. So we're not going to let you see him. I said to them, why he has to be strip searched? I cannot touch him. He can't touch me. Why you have to... You know, he's only in your position the whole time. No, this is the rule, you have to go home. So I went home that day, I felt so angry. It's like they treat us as animals. Yeah. All the reasons, the causes they make so that they can hum humiliate people and make their life miserable. So that's one of the stories I remember from prison time. <coughs> And then taking us from one prison to another, they kept moving him. And uh, even after he got, uh, you know, the, the plea agreement and everything, they moved him to Tallahassee. And from Tallahassee, they moved him to Atlanta. Like nine prisons he had to go through until he reached Virginia. And that's why I had to leave Tampa, Florida also, and just move to Virginia and live there for God knows how long. And that's when they started a new case against my husband. So what happened is that, you know that there was a big trial in downtown Tampa uh, at the federal court in 2005. So we had to go through two years of waiting for the trial and get prepared for the trial. And the trial lasted for six long months until the verdicts came with no guilty verdict for four Defendants, one of them was my husband. Thank God, no guilty verdict. Ten jurors wanted to acquit us of all the charges, but two women who, you know, were not racist, maybe they were, God knows what was on their mind. They said, we don't have evidence, but we have a feeling. We should convict them, okay? So, because of that, Unfortunately, my husband was acquitted of charges and there were some charges that were kept hung 
and uh, you know, thinking of another trial and thinking of all the headache we had to go through and my kids, of course, we didn't want to do that. So we signed a plea agreement that ex excludes cooperation with the government, which means no more dealing with the government. That my husband would agree to a voluntary uh, deportation from America, he would give up his green card and the legal status and just leave America. And that the government would have no business with him. Unfortunately, this situation did not last because there was this Zionist guy, a prosecutor in Virginia, who wanted to torment my family, my husband, all of us, you know, um, and he subpoenaed my husband to Virginia to testify before a grand jury. And my husband said, this is against the agreement I signed with the government, and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to testify. And uh, my husband was released before, a new, because he was charged, unfortunately, with two charges of criminal contempt, because he refused to testify. He was released on bail, and he was put in a confinement, in house confinement. He was uh, under house arrest for at least four years. Yeah, for four years at least. And uh, of course, that was so tough for him. To be in, in the house, imagine if you sit in the house for years and years, you only go out to see a doctor. Like every four months, you go out and see a doctor and uh, no more going out. It was tough for me, too, to deal with him, you know, dealing with a person who is confined, his freedom isn't with him anymore. I mean, even if you were in the, in the house, uh, there were so many restrictions. And then, thank God, little by little, the restrictions were lifted. And what's more important is that um, the charges were dropped by the government because they felt that the judge didn't want to have a trial. The judge did not, was not convinced that uh, there wasn't uh, an agreement that uh, you know, uh, allows my husband not to testify or cooperate. So the government dropped the charges. Uh, that was end of June, last June, thank God. And now we have to find a country so we can leave America because that's part of the deal. My husband is compli complying with the deportation agreement he signed with the government, and he's looking for a country. It is going to be very hard for us, of course, to live far away from our kids and our friends. America, we came to America when we were very young. My husband was 17, I was 18. I mean, he came a few years earlier, and that's fine. So... <laughs> convinced me that you know America is bad. I mean, this is not true. I see how people, how they love us and support us and they care about justice. And that's what the Muslim community always should remember, that you have to be part of this society. You have to be united with your fellow Americans in fighting against social injustice and fighting against racism. You know, look at what happened in Ferguson. What is our role here? A young African-American man was killed in cold blood, you know. What did we do? We have to stand up and talk against injustice. Oh, everywhere, even if a Muslim person did it, you know. We have to always be very objective and very unbiased. And we should denounce terrorism, racism, we should denounce all the social ills and just be one hand with my fellow Americans, all of us. And thank you very much. Maybe I forgot some things, but maybe I just one little thing, one more thing I want to mention is that you know our government is justifying its war on, on I mean, against political activists because of the terrorist actions that happened and all that. You know, when September 11th took place, 
we, the Muslim community, were very, the, like the first ones who condemned what happened on September 11th. And we were acting very hard and doing, you know, a lot of things to teach our kids to denounce terrorism, to denounce all those horrible things that people, some people might do and do to others. And because of that, you know, look what the government did. They, they left the real terrorists and they just came and picked up my husband, who's a political activist, who was always outspoken, who believed in America and the ethics and the morals of the American society, you know, the, as a beacon for justice and freedom and all that. And again, when you know, when you fight and fight, you find maybe you lose hope. But when I saw and the jurors saw that group of people downtown Tampa, when they were raising signs at the time of our trial, saying that sending money to orphans and uh, widows in Palestine is not a crime. What Dr. Samuel Larian did was not a crime. That affected the jurors a lot. Sometimes a small group of people, small actions they do can do you know, big effect on others. So do not underestimate any little thing we do for justice. Okay, and that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you. The charges have been dropped. Um, the other part of the plan goes into effect and is trying to find a host of another host country. Um, in the past, Egypt has been thrown around as a possible destination. Is that still the case, or are there other uh, options that are being weighed for the countries that we shot? Yeah. Well, first of all, we are Palestinian refugees. I, I am an American citizen now, but my husband is still a Palestinian refugee. And our country is occupied by Israel, so there is no hope that we can go back to occupied Palestine. Uh, Egypt was an option until the coup took place. The military coup in Egypt took place last year, and since then Egypt is going down the drain. The, you know, there are no human rights, no political rights. A lot of people are in jail or got killed in cold blood. I cannot. Believe we can live there in safety or in freedom in Egypt. The Egyptian regime is so against the Palestinian people. Look at what happened in the latest war in Gaza. The Egyptian regime really worked with the Israelis against the Palestinian people. First of all, you know that the only border that Gaza has with an Arab country is with Egypt. And who is closing down this border and treating Palestinians like in human beings or whatever, like animals, it's the Egyptians. They are horrible. Instead of giving us support, opening the borders, they are even worse than the Israelis in protecting us. You know, so Egypt is out of the question now. Unfortunately, we cannot go back there. But we are still looking for countries, and I hope in the near future we will find one to settle down. It's just causing us a lot of anxiety, so we don't know where to go and which country will accept us. And but there are no Western lands that are... That are well, Canada. Even Canada. Canada is, unfortunately, no, is, is pro-Israel in a crazy yeah. way. And, uh, hmm. and don't forget my husband is a Palestinian activist, and it's not easy. So what, what does this mean then for your time still? We are just doing our um, part, you know, we are looking for an and I hope we can find one. Yeah, maybe Mars as something. That might be. It's outrageous. It was your brother Mazen's situation in the, in the county jail that got me first interested in what was happening to you and others, you know, and um, so I always remember Mazen. <coughs> Thank you so much. Basim, uh, you will not believe it, he's in Egypt, but he has nothing to do with politics. But I'm still worried about him. You know, he's uh, living a very uh, miserable life there. But where can he go? There are no other places to go to. Yeah. And <coughs> maybe some people don't know what happened to Basim. What happened to Mason? Yeah, I'm gonna say briefly what happened to my brother, and this tells you 
how miserable my life was since 95. <laughs> my husband. <laughs> so, in, yeah, in 95, the Tampa Tribune, the Tribune started attacking us and tying my husband to this and that because he was, again, outspoken against what's happening to the Palestinians by Israel. And it's like something, you know, unusual for a Palestinian to talk about the inhumane, about the criminal occupation of his country. I don't know what's wrong about that. You look at South Africans, they say, you know, every cussing word against their occupiers, you know, the white minority government and all that, it's fine. But if you say, this to Israel or this or that, you know, I'm not talking about. But if you say anything, even though you are oppressed, you are occupied, you don't feel happy about the occupation, you cannot say a word, you know. So because my husband was outspoken <coughs> and active for the Palestinian cause, uh, my husband has been targeted. They used my brother through the immigration uh, channel to make him say something about my husband or this or that. Anyway, the government arrested my brother in 1997 and put him uh, in detention without bail, any chance of bail, uh, using secret evidence against him. And this is the first time in America I heard of something called secret evidence, <laughs> where a person cannot see the accusation against him cannot see the accuser, nothing, only something hidden from him. And my brother was detained for almost four years. And we were working with conscientious people who cared about justice like uh, you. Know. Dwight, of course, Dwight and Mary, I'm just talking. But now my mind went to that. So Dwight and lots of wonderful people. We worked hard to get my brother free. And I remember, and this shows you what the government really does to people. We found a country for my brother, uh, Guyana in South America. They accepted him and we, he was about to, to leave. What did our government do? They went to the Guyanese government saying to them, why you want this man? He's a terrorist. Don't take him. So of course, there was no visa. So the government comes and tells us, leave. We don't want you here. And then they come and sabotage our chances of leaving. So anyway, my brother, uh, we worked so hard to uh, find him a country. And thank God, he's in Egypt now. Hopefully, nothing bad will happen to him. I had, had a question. Uh, do the government have a, a time frame on what time you have to leave the country? Or is That's a good question. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's too general. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, they want us to leave as soon as possible, of course. And we are working hard to find the country. So I hope. It's because you're a fighter. That's why they want you to leave. Because you speak for other people for your payment and because you're here. That's why they wanted to leave. Well, I think also they want uh, not to remember us because, thank God, we defeated them. One more quick question and then and then we'll move on. It's not a quick question, but um, I heard about this um, event on the uh, MNF Street Talk. And Samir has said that she's a Palestinian, and she has said that she is for um, a nonviolent way of resolving the conflict. And I'm thinking if something like, if you say, I'm going to kill you, I swear to God, they'll say that's free speech here. But if you say something like death to Israel, and that scares them to death, maybe uh, maybe there's another way to do it. But do you think it's possible to do it through nonviolent? Yeah, you see, my dear, what happened is that people grow old and they grow wiser. Of course, maybe if we had looked back at these words, maybe, you know, we would have changed the language. But it will not change the situation of the Palestinian people, okay, and the Israeli occupation. Yeah, what will is, I believe, in the power that the American people have here in changing the situation in Palestine. 
The American taxpayers are the ones who support the Israeli occupation, unfortunately, you know, with their monies and all that. So that's why they don't want us to be here, I, I think. They don't want Palestinian activists to be outspoken, to reach out to their fellow Americans and talk about what's happening in Palestine and the injustices and all that. Let's talk more, even, okay? Let's talk more, educate people, and see. I'm very sure there will be a big difference. And the whole conflict can be resolved peacefully. We don't need weapons to resolve it. Just you know, see what the problem is and say, no more money for weapons. No more money to any side, okay? Not one side. Um, can I, can yeah. I add something to the lady, the nonviolence way? There's a big movement called BDS. Mm -hmm. This is the boycott, divest, and sanction against the Israeli uh, products, supporting those who support them. It's a big movement. You can join in. And We're it's very effective. We're trying to individually boycott products, as well as inclusive you know, markets, corporations. Yeah. So this is a product. Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, I can speak to you after the Yeah. Okay, it will be time afterwards that we still have the fellowship follow up and we will talk more about things. We'll hand right for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question the great news came during Ramadan this yeah. past summer, correct? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering for your husband, if it's not too personal a question, how did his faith help in getting him through this tragedy? This is, I don't know, it's a beautiful question, but it's like God knows what's in our heart. But yeah, his faith really helped him go through a very tough time in jail, you know. They tried, as I told you, to torture, not torture, but yeah, sometimes they did that too. But torment him so much, you know. And the conditions, I remember that time, were very similar to what happened. Well, the prisoners in Guantanamo had like freezing uh, temperature in the prison cell, you know, and fire driving alarms. him. Ah, the fire alarms all the time, sounding, sounding. That would prevent him from sleeping. You know, clock all the time. Yeah, and solitary confinement. That's where he used to be in a long time. For a long time in a solitary confinement. And imagine if you stay in one small room for just a few days and see how you would feel. That was before the trial. It was meant to really like destroy him and break him completely before even his trial started. This is the absolute last very short. In relation to the last lady's uh, issue about religious uh, you know, strength and so forth, the surviving all this. Did they allow him Islamic literature in prison? Because I've had contact with many Islamic prisoners uh, who are desperate for Islamic literature and are not allowed it because it's considered, you know, violent. Uh, I mean, the prison officials uh, all over this country, both the uh, state and local uh, jails as well as federal prisons, have this attitude that uh, Islamic literature is inherently subversive and violent, so therefore it must be suppressed. Only the Quran is allowed. They actually allow him any Islamic literature? Well, uh, that's a very good question. Before, because. When he was here in Poland and all that, that was like early 2000s, in 2003, 4, 5. There was no problem. But later on, they have implemented new laws that prevented prisoners from receiving lots of books. And not only that, there was something that's so weird that happened in the American prisons. They consider the Arabic language a terrorist language. Yeah. You cannot <laughs> even so pray in Arabic. Uh, they, he had to pray when he was in Warsaw, uh, Virginia, Warsaw County Jail. He had to pray in English, and he said, yes. "I can." Yeah. They said, "Yes, everything, even the like the chapters from the Quran." He had to recite them in his prayer in English. That was crazy. But this shows that if, you know, if we allow our government. <laughs> It's against the Constitution, just a small issue of religious freedom, but you know, yeah, Exactly. This is against uh, human rights, if we don't say constitutional rights. But that's why we really have to work very hard, guys, all of us, you know, to fight for what's happening in the prisons and outside the prisons, 
we cannot uh, also let the families of political prisoners feel isolated and lonely. Please give them the love they need because this means you will have healthy citizens in this country. Those children of political prisoners, when they find themselves isolated, this will affect their brains. We don't want this to happen. Thank you. when I first found out, Mazza was the first thing I found out about, was the number of these uh, Muslims, especially prisoners, that go into solitary confinement before the trial for months and years. And it happened to Sammy, and it happened to our next speaker also. And if you haven't been in to look at the solitary cell, that's the size of this been all this time in. So um, we'll let us happen to talk more about that. And it happened for me. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Brothers and sisters in faith, thank you for your support, continuous support for supporting us in the past, and now, and you will continue, inshallah, to support us. I just want to uh, go through some numbers that Sister uh, Nahla missed on. Uh, Brother Sammy, I think uh, trial costed him $1.2 million, and that was the resources of the whole family in Egypt, in Jordan, in Palestine. They had to sell everything in the states and outside the country to get that money, and some from the community, because the community were afraid, and they couldn't support, not because they don't have it, they have it, but they were afraid if they support this case, they'll be haunted later on on it. For that reason, I chose the public defender to defend my case, because I couldn't afford to pay millions of dollars for attorney. And the public defender took my case, and I had a good team, 12 members on the team working between translators, investigators, and attorneys. And I even requested at one time I need an attorney who is Arab but not Muslim, Christian. So, you know, we'll be on the safe side defending this case in front of the jury and the judge. And they, they made that available for me. Thank God that the, you know, the system works in some ways, you know, in your favor. My case costed the Public Defender Office $7.5 million of your tax money. 7.5 million dollars. The government case against us cost 500 million dollars, your tax money. 500 million dollars. If you like to see your money go against or go towards another case, you know, you just get, sit home and don't complain and don't participate in these events and you need to support to stop, you know, the injustice in this country because it's coming out of your tax money. 500 million dollars is a lot of money from our taxpayers money to be put in for such fabricated case that they did not get one guilty out of the 200 counts, not one guilty count. We were all acquitted, two of us acquitted of all charges. Me and Sammy, they hung up on eight. The eight was 12, uh, 10 to two, the jury, and we had to plea, just like Sister Nahada said, because we couldn't afford another trial. The government couldn't afford another trial. They offered the plea. We did not start the plea with them. They said, you know what? You know, we can't afford another trial. Let's plea. And we agreed on a certain time, on a lesser charge, and we did our time, and thank God we're out and we're free. I'm not gonna talk about the case. I'm gonna talk about the room that we spent four years in solitary confinement in, in Terre Haute, Indiana. I was uh, put in in Coleman when I first Self-surrender, I asked the judge, Judge Moody, to self-surrender, not to be taken from court that day, so I had to spend the holiday with my kids and my wife in Tampa. I was in Coleman for three months. Coleman, Florida, 45 to an hour drive from here. It was like seven-star hotel compared to where they transferred me in January of 2007. So it was general population. I wasn't in a penitentiary like Brother Sammy was. I was in a general population, you know, 24-7 with 160 people in, in one big room. Uh, I had like uh, four, four mates in my uh, cubicle. It was like cubicles, it wasn't cells. Until we get transferred to Indiana. I arrived in Indiana. Of course, going to Indiana took me two weeks. Chicago, Atlanta, here and there. I had to make a few stops and visit, you know, a few uh, um, jails to get to Indiana. When we get to Indiana, the unit that we live in, they had created that unit that year, December, I think, the year before, and they opened it in January. 
called the uh, CMU, Communication Management Unit. I found 13 inmates, of whom are Muslim and have terrorism charges, and convicted with, you know, um, sentenced to life or 85 years or 45 years or 155 years. One of them was, you know, a white American convicted, uh, a, a convert, Muslim. He was uh, convicted with 155 year sentence. So uh, two, three months later, the number reached up to 54. That unit was for the death row inmates 30 years back. When they built a new unit, they shut it down and it was not used for anything. They used it, I think, for 1986 or 88 riots in Atlanta for the Cubans, and they used it for a few months and they took them out, transferred them because it was not a livable place. The rats are this big, the cockroaches are this yeah. big, and they're with you in the cell. I mean, you're sleeping and you're just talking to rats and, and roaches, and there is no air conditioning. In the summer, we would melt. In the winter, we would freeze. There is no, no heat, no air condition. And 24-7, you're in your cell. And the size of the cell you saw, it looks big, empty, because you have the concrete bed on the left, the table, the metal table, the toilet seat on the right. So there is just enough space for you to walk. When, I mean, when I was there, I, was, I went in at 310 pounds. So I had to lose some weight. Well, I did lose some weight because there was no food and, you know, there's no health in there. I went down to 2.30 in order for me to walk, you know, uh, you know comfortably in that cell. And uh, the, they wouldn't allow us to pray together. They wouldn't allow us to go to libraries. They wouldn't allow us to go out for the gym, for the, rec for the recreation. We have to do everything in our cell. You have to do prayer, shower, everything. You have to do it in your cell. And uh, the conditions were, I mean, if you, if you needed to go to the doctor, if you're in pain, uh, uh, it takes you a month to go to the doctor because they designate a day for the CMU terrorist people to go to the regular general population from underground, in the tunnels underground. They will shut down the complex in Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana, the low, the medium, and the max. They will shut everything down, put all the inmates in their rooms so the terrorists can go to see the doctor for five minutes and come back. That's how bad it was in Indiana. Besides all this, we were allowed five, 15 minutes calls twice a month. 15 minute calls twice a month versus 300 minutes in Coleman. Um, any time, any day, any minute you can call your family. The visits, here you have contact visits. You get to see them every week, every holiday. Over there, it was once a month, two hours, behind the glass, on the phone. So my family used to travel from Tampa to Chicago to Indiana to get to me, my wife and three children, $3,000 trip to see me for two hours and talk to me on the phone. And they used to do it once a year because we couldn't afford to do it more than that. So, um, and everybody else there is the same, the 54 inmates. Now, when the number was over 60 and they only had 60 cells in that unit. They build another unit in Marion, Illinois, I think. And they split us in two, and the number, I think, reached 84. So they put like 45 here and 40 some here. And few of us came out, finished our short sentence, um, and uh, the rest are serving 15 to 155 years in there. The rest of the inmates, Muslims, Later on, they brought non-Muslims to just show that this is not designated for Muslims only. They brought some from Colombia, some from Croatia, from here and there, just to make it look, you know, this is uh, justice. And uh, faith, faith played a big role. If you don't have a strong faith in that cell for four years or two years or even a month, some people cannot <coughs> take it. I mean, you will just kill yourself. And, you know, faith uh, played a big role, prayers played a big role. And uh, the only issue we had was the family and getting in touch with the family. And we were worried about our families out there because they were isolated from the community. The people were, you know, some people were not supportive. Some people are supportive. And mostly the media, the media keep on, you know, harassing the families and, you know, 
the kids, they just cannot take it. They just want to live their life. It's not their fault that their father or their uncle or, you know, one of the family member is, is in this messed up situation. And they, I mean, born and raised here, they just want to have, you know, their rights and their life and they want to enjoy it. And they didn't have the support from nor the government nor the media. So these things, you know, help when we help the families of the incarcerated when we uh, uh, communicate with them. It's not a crime to communicate with the wife or the sister or the son of a convicted felon. I mean, he is a convicted felon, but we know it's a political issue. It's not a criminal issue. We didn't kill no people. We didn't send money to, for people to kill people. We send money to, for people to eat, to just you know drink clean water in Gaza or, or elsewhere in the, in the world. That's, that's all, that's our crime. That basically, that's why we were, you know, that's part of the charges. The others, the other charges, because we were outspoken. Brother Samuel was outspoken everywhere he goes, and they just didn't like it. I mean, this is something that will affect how the system works. And the secret evidence issue, the HR 2121, when they added this new bill against uh, Mazin, it was created because of Brother Mazin. Brother Sammy had to work hard and visit Congress and Senate I remember him and Sister Nahla walking down the aisles of the Congress and the Senate without a shoes on because they, they get tired talking to every senator and every congressman that signed that bill. That bill was signed by a congressman or a senator without even reading what's in that bill. It was taken from his intern, it's good for your campaign, it's good for the election, sign it off. So they all signed it off without knowing how much effect that would affect them as, you know, Americans, not just Muslims or Arab or anybody else that's foreign. So, you know, he made people understand that this is not right for everybody, and they reversed that decision. So when that decision was reversed, that's when they decided, we don't want this man around here. He is gonna, he is gonna affect everybody in Congress and Senate, and he is gonna affect the Israeli lobbyist here, and, and our relationship with Israel, so we need to stop him. We need to put him in jail, and that's what happened. So if you have any questions um, about the confinement, because the, I'm here to just answer questions about the confinement of uh, the brothers that are serving lifetime in Indiana and Illinois. Yes. Are they allowed to have Islamic literature besides the Quran? Or um, in the Quran? Well, I, I heard they're not allowed anymore to have it. In, in, in the beginning, Indiana. no. <clears throat> we were not, but we have to fight for it and we fought for it, and they would allow us five books at a time. And the books, they must come in, and uh, Washington must inspect every book before it. So when the book is sent by, in a, by my family through a library or bookstore, you cannot send it direct, it has to be soft cover. Um, they will in the, you know, you know, investigate the book for about 60 days before you receive it if it's approved. And most of the books that they were trying to send me were not approved, were returned to the library or to the bookstore that was purchased. But at, 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 you know, at <coughs> last, we were allowed to have some literature beside the Quran, five books at a time in your cell. Tariq. Tariq. Yes, How many brothers from this community still in confinement? Plus, uh, is there any other legal uh, support for a young man that's in confinement currently? Uh, from this community, no one. Uh, but from surrounding states there is, from surrounding cities down south there is, from the nation there is, there is the total now I think it's 90, I believe the number is 90 in both, both places, the CMU Indiana and the CMU Illinois. And you can support them by, um, I guess there is literature and this uh, organization here, the uh, NCPCF, you can take the brochure here. This uh, supports the families, supports the inmates. They send them money, you know, once or twice a year. You can send the inmate money because they need it so bad, and their family need the support, so they can even support them. So sending a hundred dollar to anybody that's a convicted felon is not going to affect you. It's not going to label you as a terrorist if you send that money to him, you know, and, and support him. So your zakat money can go and support. And if you don't want to send it direct, just give it to this organization. It will be protected and they will deliver every penny you support those inmates. Yes, Madak. I know churches send pastors or counselors or chaplains to the jails or to different prisons. Are you able to have contact with any imams or religious leaders? No, no. <coughs> so it's our
confinement, no contact visits, no phones. You're only allowed 15 minutes phone call, two 15 minutes phone calls a month, and it must be a, a immediate family member. And if they call and you know by mistake your son hang up, you lost your 15 minutes for the month. Good luck next month. Paul. Yes. Um, I know you touched upon a little bit earlier, but I, I you know, from my understanding, solitary confinement can trigger people to get various like mental illnesses, and so I was just wondering if you could expand upon that, whether you know something you experienced or something you've seen other inmates um, experience. It, it has its effect, but not to a point where we want to commit a suicide. You know, like like I said, faith played a big role. We had our Quran, our literature, we were reading, we were memorizing it out here. When you're out in the free, you can read the book, you can memorize anything, but in there, you know, we, we read the Quran, the Hadith, the, the Islamic literature, other books that we never had the time to read. We would read, you know, those five books, they come in, finish them in a week or two weeks. No, not really. We, we were with faith, strong faith, we did okay. I'm talking about the 80 people only. I, I mean, I can't speak on the other... On behalf of the others who are in general population or in solitary confinement in big places that are not communication unit that monitor by DC. They had cameras in the hallways and in, in, in front of our cells. Voice and video that, you know, Homeland Security watching every move we make. Every, every prayer we do. Every book we read. So they were just listening and watching us what we do 24-7. Thank you, Hatham. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be here after four, won't you, if you have more questions, because these are a wealth of information. And now, on a positive note, these two cases show that there is a, a delight at the end of the tunnel, but the struggle is going to continue. And I'm going to ask Jared Hamill, who is from Stop FBI Repression, to introduce our next speaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a local activist in, in the Tampa Bay area, but I'm with a group called the Committee to Stop FBI Repression. Um, so our next speaker is Avni Uh He is the brother of a uh, local St. Pete man, uh, Sammy Osmokov. And so basically, um, recently, uh, this summer, uh, Sammy was convicted on charges related to terrorism. And so his brother is going to be talking about how the FBI uh, specifically took advantage of his mental illnesses and entrapped him to carry out fake plots that the FBI themselves had planned. So with that, uh, Avni Oscar. early 2010 and we noticed that we told him to go and see a doctor he would refuse he would just storm at the house and not listen to us anymore because he never experienced that before being sick and everything so he started going to local moms asking moms and people for help and that's what he meant like I don't even know if he was he disappeared like informant and he was with him for like 16 months and he would just teach some things, to sh like show him videos that has nothing to do with religion. Like, just take advantage of his sickness. And then he told him, I got another person I want you to meet. And he's going to get you a job and everything. And there was a guy in Bush Boulevard here in Tampa, Palestinian man, Raul Dubaos, Abu Yusuf, that's what he called himself. He offered him a job. And since then, they've been recording from early 2010. They've been recording everything he was saying and everything that we're doing behind the ground, like behind the scenes, they were saying stuff, make him say these things, make him say these things. So when my brother would say something, they started recording it. And everything you guys, if anybody has seen the cases or the videos, everything you see is what they want you to see. Everything in the background, they don't show you anything. My brother turned down three, four times. He didn't want to do nothing like this. And they kept pushing him, offering him, like, if you didn't help us, we'd get you to Mecca. Because he said, 
he was sick and he wanted to go to Mecca and help, like find help over there or something. And it's been going on for over two years that they did this, till they finally got him. And the same day that I got him, he said, actually, I don't want to do that. And those videos and audios, they disappeared. The informants never came to trial, never showed up. They made excuses saying that the informants went to Palestine. One of them went to Palestine, he has brain cancer. I know it's a lie. He's probably working on another case. And ever since then, we've, we've sold everything to try to get him. We had like four different lawyers. Nothing's happening. So I don't know really what to say. Is it they you're referring to, the FBI? Yeah. Yes. They had 128 agents and informants working with my brother. Well, he's been sick since 2010. He's in solitary. When you say sick, are we talking about mental or emotional illness or a physical problem? There's seven doctors, psychiatrists that said he's mentally ill. Okay. So it was easy to trick him and get him confused and get him involved in something he didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Well, the whole time they've been doing it over and over until he gave in. Yeah, the rest of it, I told him you can become an informant and then we let you go, but you gotta sign somebody else. And when that didn't happen? No, he said I won't do that. And where is he now? He's still in jail. Like, he's in solitary. Are they allowing him any medical assistance and treatment? They gave him medication, but it's not helping. He wants to see him, huh? Tell him to let him Where would you tell people to go on the internet to, to, to find more information? I don't know. I just met Jared and Mel. I don't know. It's like my old family like looks at the thing and they're doing that over and over. This is like the 538th case that they're doing is people like this. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Jared. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, uh, Sammy's uh, sentencing hearing is happening in November. Um, and so there's a petition over there people can sign up. But basically, uh, you know, we're going to have uh, an action outside the courthouse on that day. And so we're asking people to come uh, in downtown Tampa, the same federal courthouse that had Sammy on her in and lots of other people. And so, um, you know, we're asking people to kind of get together and help us fight with this. You know, it's a recent case. You know, they just tried him in, in uh, I think, June and over a couple of weeks, and they found him guilty real quick. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a common theme in the country. So it's basically, you know, if you want to get involved, if you want to help out, uh, please sign the petition and, uh, you know, help, help people out. <clears throat> Um, at trial, did his lawyers raise entrapment as a defense, and if they did, what was the outcome of that? How did that? Well, the entrapment defense didn't work because there were everything security. All the things that could prove that my brother was entrapped, they made the national security reason. They don't want to release papers, transcripts, videos, audios, nothing. Everything that released is against him. Everything that can defend him is national security. Pseudonym. So even the defense lawyer didn't know who the witness was. I mean, it was unbelievable, except I've been seeing it over and over again ever since I met, <laughs> ever since I met the other. And here, 
I want to tell you what, there's a movie being shown by St. Peter's and NCPCF uh, at Gennaro Coffee. And Monday at seven, called Informants, which is by it was by Trevor Aronson, who wrote the book Fact, um, Terror Factory, of uh, how the you know the whole business of entrapping terror. So I urge you to come to that. It's the seven o'clock on Monday, and we have a break schedule now. So if you would like to go, but don't miss stop fbi.net just to briefly talk about what we do before I introduce the speakers. Currently, we're working on the Rasmia Oda case. She's a Palestinian-American woman from Chicago who is going on trial now again in November, on November 4th. And so we're just trying to rally around her case because like um, the other speakers here, she is another political prisoner. She's a very active anti-war activist in her community. And because of that, and the fact that she is a Palestinian American woman, she is, has charges against her um, from the government. And so, if you're more, if you want to hear more about her case, uh, we have our sign-in sheet up there, and you can also just talk to me or Jared about it and getting more involved locally with her case. And so, the next speaker, um, her name is Tracy Mole. She is from Minneapolis. She is part of the Committee to Stop FBI Repression. And she has been an activist for years now. She has been involved with Students for a Democratic Society, currently involved with the Wel Welfare Rights Committee up in Minneapolis. And she is quite an inspirational person. And I'm glad to be um, involved in the same organization that she is. And so without further ado, here's Tracy Mole. of when my home, along with six other homes in Minneapolis and Chicago, were raided, also the offices of the Anti-War Committee. Common string amongst all of these is that we were all major organizers during the Republican National Convention in St. Paul in 2008. After the raids happened, we look around and we're trying to figure out what's the common thread. Well, it's an informant. It's a spy, a professional liar, who joined the Anti-War Committee in 2008 in February of 2008, helped to be part of organizing for the Republican National Convention and then stuck around, right? So she sticks around for two and a half years, reporting hours of, of meetings, of social gatherings, of people hanging out with their babies, just coming to every event and taking an, another opportunity to lie, to try to convince people that they she should be trusted, that she should get names of other activists in the Twin Cities community, in Chicago, all around the country, right? So when they come to our homes, they take sign-in sheets, they take phones, they take our computers, all of the things that help us do our activism, all the things that have helped myself organize to free Palestine, right? In 2004, I took a trip. They said, when they came to my home at 7 a.m., I'm in a bathroom. And they say, well, we want all of the things that you got in Palestine. Trinkets, we want names, we want the notes that you took in, all the meetings that you had. Clearly fishing for more, right? They don't want just us, they want more. We had 23 people in the end all subpoenaed across the country. These are people who have been doing activism for, some of them for decades, for many, many decades, doing all types of activism. And now the FBI has all these files. Shortly afterwards, there is a case brought against Carlos Montes. I don't know if people have heard of him. He's a longtime activist in the LA area. He was one of the Brown Berets, one of the founding members of the Brown Berets, a Chicano liberation organization. They, you know, there's these behind the scenes meetings that happen between FBI and local PD, and they say, well, he's related to these other people. And just on the record, we threw investigation during his court case, we find that there is a, a meeting between the prosecutor in our case and the LAPD. So they raid his house at 5 a.m., guns blazing, <coughs> and they break down his door and point guns in his face because they say decades earlier he had been arrested and received a felony charge, and now he is in possession of a, of a handgun, registered handgun. He had had it for years. 
and so they want to put him in jail. Clearly related to our case. Like, uh, the point is that they're using the information that they got to go after other people. Very, very scary. And so, uh, you know, today I'm to tell you all about our case, and it's been going on for a long time. We have a lot of information on stuffffbi.net, but I want to kind of appeal to people to get involved for Russ Mann. She is a, an amazing woman activist who's in Chicago now, born in Palestine during Nakba, right? Her life has been struggled from the day that she was born. They were kicked out of Jerusalem. She was put in jail, in Israeli jails, and tortured into a confession, brutally, brutally tortured. They brought her father in and tortured her father in front of her. Just awful, right? So she's tortured into a confession. She leaves the country, of course, because after you get released, it's not exactly a friendly place you want to stay, which is true for many Palestinians, of course. Uh, she comes to the United States. 20 years later now, they're bringing a case against her. Well, why, is, why 20 years later? She's a co-worker of Hatem Abadea, one of the 23, one of the people who had his homes raided, and is part of the documents I'm sure that they seized from Hatem. Her first day in court, the prosecutor from our case is sitting there next to them. This is an immigration charge and a Homeland Security uh, prosecutor sitting next to this man. So, uh, you know, I don't want myself or any of the 23 of us to go to jail, but I definitely don't want Rosmia to go to jail. This woman has been organizing in Chicago for uh, the better part of a decade now. She was, uh, she's a, an associate director of the, of the AAAN, the American Arab American Action Network and formed the Women's Committee. 600 women in Chicago, in the Chicago area, Arab women and Muslim women have been empowered through the amazing work that she does. Language classes, just social classes, uh, different di lots of different types of social and educational process and leadership training. That's just, a, it's unprecedented, right? It doesn't happen very often in the United States that we find ways to help empower each other especially in communities that are under attack right now, like their community and Muslim community. Um, so uh, I hope that people really do go to the stopsbi.net uh, website. We have been doing call-in days like, uh, uh, like Mel talked about before. There are, some, I think, some of the best ways to help put pressure and to actually gain some leverage to stop some of these attacks. Because the, the reality is these attacks happen because they, first and foremost, want to intimidate people who speak out. That's a pretty clear message that you can hear from all of these stories. They want to intimidate people who speak out, in particular around Palestine, which is just disgusting. It's very clear that there is an occupation going on and our government is funding it. But they also want to make people in the United States scared and justify the Homeland Security budget. Mm -hmm. And so they find people that are socially isolated and drag them into these plots to scare the American public into basically into continuing to support this war on terror. Now, the war that's everlasting mm -hmm. with this new group that's, uh, you know, who's ever seen ISIL or ISIS in their lives? Yeah. yeah. Nobody, yeah. nobody. Yeah. The reality is there, it's not the problem. The problem is that the US government needs to make us scared so that they can keep justifying their budget and their attacks at home upon the, Mar the Muslim and Arab community and now the activist community. You know, it's, it's always, um, really empowering to come and speak in a, in a full room, but it's very clear. It's like, a, one of these things is not like the other. I'm not Muslim, I'm not Arab. And why are they going after us now? Why are they going after us now? Because they want to ensure that their intimidation is full blown. To make it clear to the activist community that you can't speak out. But the thing that is always uh, most empowering is that uh, the thing that, that got us into this, our activism, is actually the thing that's keeping us out of jail. The fact is our activism in uh, mobilizing for Carlos ensured that he didn't spend one day in jail after trying to try him for an additional felony charge. He, not, he, got, no char he got a charge that was dropped six months later. He ended up with a great plea deal that ended with no jail time and his charges are now off of his record. And I believe we can do the same for us, Mia, and for future cases. <coughs> The way that we do that is by going to events like this and hearing about people's cases, and by donating money, by writing letters. The NCPCF does an amazing letter writing campaign. I have the letter from my one of the people that I've now befriended in, in Terre Haute. So it's uh, organizing together is what will get us out of this. And so I really hope that people keep coming out. This is a, a 
a great event and a wonderful to see so many people here. The reality is uh, my case is so connected with all the other cases and so similar, despite the fact that I don't look like any, you know, mm -hmm. like most of the people who are in this, in this situation. Yeah. I have a lot to learn and a lot of great inspiration from Hatem and from Samuel Aryan. that we can win by standing up. Thank you for sharing again. I remember about a year ago I was up there sharing my situation too and just so people know they are targeting activists in relation to particularly when you're organizing against major events like the RNC. I was one of the organizers for the RNC here and um, and also involved somewhat in Minneapolis too with the Poor People's Economic Human Rights yeah. Campaign. I know yeah. you know Sherry. Yeah. Um, and I, I, two things I just want to share. It, it is very real, and they do different kinds of intimidation, not always uh, direct arrest, uh, particularly for activists as opposed to Arabs or, or Muslims. Uh, in my case, I was visited by the Secret Service and basically threatened. Their pretense was that I was going to, they had heard I was going to arm the homeless to take out government officials. Um, <laughs> Anyway, by the, it took them a while to find me, which was kind of interesting, but uh, they had went to my ex-wife, intimidated her at work to try to find me, and my brother, they talked to the local police, and um, they basically told me if I ever go to Washington, I need to let them know. I told my lawyer this, and he said, well, you don't have to tell them anything, which I haven't, but they probably knew that I've been there many times. Uh, and they also would frequently, at that time, stop my vehicle the, there's always in local police an anti-terrorism division and searched my vehicle and intimidated me that way. And it is a very real thing. That same summer that I was visited, my car was mysteriously firebombed. They still haven't found out who did it or anything related with that. But I think it's particularly still the most difficult uh, to uh, deal with amongst Arab and, and Muslim communities because Last year I was in jail for uh, <clears throat> attempting to videotape the police harassing the homeless. And while in there, I met a uh, Arab Muslim gentleman who was in there, and he didn't even know why he was in there, by the way. He was, they were waiting to send him to federal court into a, a federal wing of the, of the jail. And everyone else got phone calls, including myself. Everyone else got to eat. Everyone else was informed of their charges, but he was told nothing. I ended up passing on the uh, situation to care, and I know they followed up on it. But it is, it is widespread still where if you're Arab or Muslim, or they think you are, that often they'll just pick you up. You know, they picked him up because he was on the roadside. You know, you see people selling rugs and all kinds of things on the roadside. Well, that's what he was doing for his job. And they said he didn't have a license. But when they picked him up, they never told him what his charges were. And this happens all the time. Um, does the Committee to Stop FBI Oppression have the legal team to defend the people that are targets of these so attacks? So we've been working with NCPCF, some of the lawyers with the NCPCF, but a lot with the, the People's Law mm -hmm. Group in Chicago. And with the, um, now I'm going to forget names of groups that I've known for a long time, uh, but kind of the National Lawyers Guild has been donating a lot of time and their lawyers have kind of matched us up with different lawyers that they have. Necessary, but we do. Thank you. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps a silly question. But I'm sure you, you did touch upon it. Your activism, without putting ourselves in danger, and of course we can never let fear hold us back. We should always speak out against ourselves. But how do you find how to meet them? Does it even exist? Is it activism? And what is your opinion? Right? Like, the idea is in activism, you want to bring as many people in as possible, right? You want people to encourage people to get involved. And that's part of what happened with the spy, right? She came in at a time when people were coming around all over the cities, all over the country, want to get involved in protesting the Republican National Convention. They're terrible, you know, it's a terrible party who does terrible things. And I think that there were several points along the way, looking back, where we said, well, her, you know, she says she's from Boston, but her accent ain't right at all. You know, like just things like that. And so I think that there are uh, finding a way to both be open 
right, to new activists, and like, you know, when you're young, it's really funny to make jokes that you're a terrorist. Well, guess what's on our affidavit? Those kind of sarcastic jokes are the reason that they got a warrant to go after, you know, to go into my house. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But how do you find a way to get where people are at, right? Where that's, they think it's kind of funny to make that joke, but help weed out people who are actually informants. And I think um, listening to your gut to be able to, if things aren't lining up, just call it out, you know? It, it's not as much fun to be really hesitant to new people in your life in general. That's very hard. You know, when I started this, I was single, and so dating was incredibly hard. But <laughs> there's also reality. Like, I don't need any jokers in my life who aren't going to respect, you know, the fact that I need to see your ID. I want to see the present. Like, not really, but it is true. There's a point where you're like, I need to know that you're a real person. Like we didn't meet any family members. We heard a lot about this fake daughter, about this fake partner, about all these things. Mm -hmm. And when those things don't materialize over a course of two or three years, when you're fairly, you know, when you are working day to day with this person, it raises some flags. And I think that trusting your gut in some of these cases is what is the thing that we didn't do. We wanted to be open. We wanted to believe this person. You have to remember, like, they're not dumb. Mm -hmm. The Anti Work Committee is a group that has a lot of gay women in it, right? And so a lot of gay women who are mothers. So this person is a gay mother. So she fit right in, you know? And so um, you, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be vigilant, you know? Just finding ways over a period of time to kind of think about, if this person were real, would I see their ID, you know? So things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, enjoy it. speaker I just met yesterday, I've been following his case for a long time though, and it's a little different and I think it's really shocking. So I'm going to introduce Ellen Taylor, and her son-in-law was the man who was being interrogated by the FBI in Orlando and ended up with seven bullets in him. Do you remember the fact that So I'm going to turn it over to Ellen now. Thank you. seen his face on the internet already and uh, the picture was uh, on TV looking awful. He was for some reason halfway naked and, and I have a much better picture which is our supporters created. So um, this is my son-in-law and uh, he was 27 years old when he got shot seven times uh, last year, 22nd of May, here in Atlanta in his own apartment. He was unarmed. He was not under arrest, and this is, uh, I have uh, some documents, but unfortunately I realize that's not going to be possible for you to go with me through this whole documents. Uh, <coughs> so you just have to trust in my voice, because I've been doing all researches uh, for the last year, and I uh, have done a lot of paperwork uh, going over, such as a report from Mr. Ashton, it's a general attorney of the state of Florida, and a report from the FBI, which is under our pressure in the care floor that they released finally after 10 months of investigation. So uh, the report is kind of huge. One of them uh, from Ashton is 161 page and another one is 600 pages from the FBI. So uh, they uh, absolutely were, uh, I think, comfortable that people will not go over this report. It's not going to look an uh, autopsy report. Most of the time when uh, Maslin died and he was from Chechnya, he didn't have no uh, family here except my daughter. She was married him and me. But we didn't stay in touch a lot. Uh, I was traveling uh, around the country and the world. I was active duty soldier at US Army. So I wanna just make sure you understand, uh, even my accent tells I'm Russian, but uh, I've been serving US Army for six and a half years as active duty soldier. And uh, we came in, in, in this country actually in 2006, uh, my, me and my two kids. In 2007, I joined Army, so I just got my medical retirement, as right now I'm a veteran. That's why I have a lot of time to come to different states and speak to people, because I want to prevent this tragedy for future. 
what happened to my son-in-law, I, I still cannot even, you know, clearly to understand how people can do stuff like this. How can they do cold blood murder? And after that, they lie to whole nation. They start talking about his background, that he was violent and uh, aggressive, which is absolutely not true. He was never, even one word what they say is not true from the beginning. But what they didn't say about background of those people who came from Boston, it was two policemen, uh, one, uh, his name is Guinea, the other one is uh, Sinelli, an FBI agent, his name Aaron McFarlane, <coughs> I will remember his name forever now. So this uh, three people, they came from Boston on 21st of May, that day they requested uh, the interview and they said it would be last interview for you, Ibrahim, so you're going to be clear. And uh, these three people, their name on the report was uh, covered by the red blocks. And uh, later on, um, thanks God, we have a good reporters, good people who is doing their job as they're supposed to be. They uh, made it um, like unredacted, this all, so we have all their names. And that's how their background popped up about violations they have done in the past. And um, Aaron McFarlane, before you joined FBI, in 2008. He actually got medical retirement in 2004 from law enforcement. So law enforcement got him medical retirement with $52,000 per year. After four years, he joined FBI, same, law enforcement. So he is getting VA check and he also worked for FBI. But when we start checking his background, while well, he was in police, in Oakland police, and um, it, it's a during that writer case, maybe some, somebody heard about this. So he has been the one involved in that, and he's been giving a false uh, testimonies. He has been uh, lying under earth. He's been beating people, arresting uh, falsely, arresting people. So it's a lot. It's a huge list, which is here we're filing last year, in 22nd of May. Uh, uh, I mean, sorry, this year, sorry, and, and it was exactly a year after the accident. So they filed this all paperwork to uh, Mr. Ashton to ask him to uh, reopen the case and do more researches on the background of those individuals. But I probably have to start from a little bit far back. The field, this whole story started on the 15th of April, which is, uh, we all remember what happened, and it was um, in Boston, Marathon. This is um, just a, a little quiz. Of course, I know I have no time <coughs> to show everything, but because it's connecting to me directly. That day, I was actually signing my paperwork to get the new house. I bought my first house in the States uh, when I moved from Germany uh, in March. So 15th of April, exactly last year, I was getting keys from my house. I didn't care about what's going on in the world. Just maybe a little couple words I've heard on the news that something horrible uh, happened in Boston. And later on, uh, I've heard that those boys was from Chechnya. <coughs> and that's how I started looking a little bit more because Chechnya is part of Russia and I'm natively Russian. So it was interesting. Who could have done such a heinous act? So why, what moved them to do this? What kind of idea they had in their heads to make this, such a horrible things for innocent people? It's not a war zone. It's not a, the White House. It's a marathon. And it, it's just, I couldn't even understand how somebody can do stuff like this. And first I started looking some details. It was a, a couple interviews from one of them was a, a, a police commissioner from Boston, Ed Davis. And I heard his interview on TV myself when he made a mistake and catch himself right away. He said, when somebody uh, from a reporter asked him, uh, how, how can you make sure there is no more people um, involved in this uh, in terror group and no more bombs in the area? He says, we know for sure that it was two actors and he caught himself two individuals. So at uh, first that would catch my ear why he said two actors about those two brothers, two knives. And that's how I started looking more information. But again, I was not too deep in there until 22nd of May. And 21st of May, those three from Boston and one local from Orlando, they came to Ibrahim's apartment before they were actually, he was under surveillance for the whole time after the Boston bombing. And because only, he knew Tamerban really well. They from some community, both Chechen, the same age group, they were attending the same gym in Boston when Ibrahim used to live there until 2011. And uh, they both was martial arts fighters, so they knew each other pretty well. And of course, when it's a small community like this, it's only 200 people in whole U.S. from Chechnya. It's a very tiny one, so everybody knows each other. There's nothing wrong about that. They attempt, uh, of course, uh, the, the masks, and they've been communicating a lot. And after my son-in-law moved to Orlando, uh, Tony Lang was calling him very often, especially right before 
this all happened in March, uh, 14th of March, my son-in-law had a surge on his knee. So he was a couple months on crutches, on the brace, he was on the pain meds for the whole this time. He was not a good fighter. I'm just trying to say what they, when they trying to make excuse that he was an M uh, MMA fighter and he was a very dangerous person when they came at the first place to his house, so they were aware of he was dangerous. He was after surgery. He was not even a good fighter in a good physical condition at that point. And he still wasn't, like I said, on his mats and, and uh, wearing that brace. But um, the another thing, uh, because he was a, a good friend of Tamerwan, so they were calling him at police station and asking him a whole bunch of questions, and it's been almost every day. So they bothered him every day. Then one day they just came to his apartment and wait until he come out. He, they dropped him on the ground, they arrested him, they took his computer, his cell phone, then they released him. Then they questioned my daughter about him when she came back from Russia from her vacation. They stopped at the airport for several hours talking about Ibrahim. At this point, we didn't even think that it, it is already a kind of signal for us that we have to do something, we have to protect ourselves. But in my mind, I was certain in this country. When I arrived here and when I received my citizenship in 2009, we were so happy. I thought it's the safest place to live, to raise kids, and just do right things, and you're gonna be okay, and nothing bad can happen to you. Yeah, I could never even think that it can touch my family like this, especially being an active duty soldier, and never have any trouble, never being arrested or accused of anything. Just doing the right things, paying taxes in time, bills in time, raising kids, doing the right things. And after this has all happened, it, it, it's my world, my trust, my life, my family being destroyed, just destroyed. And I don't think we can put together back how it was before, ever in this life. But my point is, my son-in-law was very dangerous for them, definitely, but not the way they tell him that. Because he had a lot of information about Tamerwan, about who our knives are, actually. And I know he knew too much for him to stay alive. And they came to his house to take a confession about triple murder, which is they didn't commit. And some of you probably had a chance, it was also unredacted on the report, the confession, what he was writing down before they shot him. And as they said, they were recording everything until the moment they actually shot him. Then they stopped recording. They were using their cell phones against actually Ibrahim's will. He was complaining because they were making a picture, having fun, and making records on him in the apartment. But anyway, so, the point is, they they told him that it's going to be last interview. That's the only one time when they said the truth. The only one time when they didn't lie. The whole report, and I went through myself to this report since I have left enough time now being home. And all report is absolute lie. And I feel so bad for Mr. Ashton because he's taking such a high position. He is taking so much responsibility to justify those people, to say they clear and that what they did it was self-defense. So I, I'm not going to show you the um, the autopsy report on the video. You can trust me. I have it on the paper. Somebody interested, you can look it up with me. There is autopsy report, which is they put on hold. They froze it for 10 months until care and uh, us family members were demanding to release it, which is they're not supposed to do because medical exam has nothing to do with the FBI. They're not working under them. They have no clue even why they should not release Autopsy report. Uh, Dr. Uh, Utz, who was talking to us in the medical exam office, he says, the report will be ready in a couple weeks and I will release it. It's, it has nothing to do with FBI. Obviously, he got a whole bunch of pressure. When we were calling him, he was not able to even answer the phone. Somebody else was answering for him. And the way he explained his medical report, especially the bruise, and I also want to show you that picture. But anyway, if you notice why I put this picture, so they show evidence against a knife that the first one on top, uh, backpack, which is black color with uh, the label, the, the white sticker on it, and they show uh, some knives, they said on surveillance camera, walking through his backpack. It's a picture of uh, Jafar, the youngest brother, with another backpack, and the guy, actually it was a lot of them like this, wearing some kind of camouflage, uh, you can tell they work for government, so it's kind of fast. I don't know who they are, don't know their name or who they belong to, but they are work for government because they are always equipped with their backpacks like this. And look where you see the match. So I don't see anything even close to the evidence what the brother Sarnaz was carrying on them. But it's not the only one thing we found, I found also. It's not just the only one thing. And I'm not, of course, I have no time to show you everything. And I was 
going to show the picture where it, it's a cruel picture I can tell right now. So I just wanted to show what, what they done to my son-in-law before they made him sign his Miranda. And before, you see that bruise on his uh, temple in, uh, on the left. So what they say on the FBI report that he, after they shot him seven times, he fell on the floor and that's after contact with the floor, he got that bruise. I don't think any of you would be kind of uh, surprised if I say that based on anatomy and uh, any other scientist words, you can say that bruise will never come up after body is dead. It's not blood flow anymore. And it's only happened when blood vessels broken and when person alive and blood still circulating. If not circulation, there is no bruise. No way. Then another thing, his body, I have also pictures, was laying on the carpet. Whole torso and the head was straight down on the carpet. So there's no way you can do such a things even if you're alive by the carpet. So it, it, it's absolutely not possible. By the shape, I can tell what they were using. It was a gun. Very simple to say. That was a gun. What they were pushing in his temple and making him sign that Miranda and make him sign that confession, which is at some point he realized they wanted him to commit, I mean, to admit that he did a murder. And he stops to writing and he, I, I don't know for sure what happened. He was trying to leave. And on the autopsy report, it says three bullets were shot in his back. In FBI reports, all the time when they explaining the shooting, they say he's been moving towards them, trying to attack them. And of course, they change a whole bunch of story. It's been everywhere published, by the way. They said it was a sword first time, which is, was broken handle, and it was just a decorated, it was hanging on the wall. They said it was a knife he was trying to pull from the kitchen. They said it was a broomstick. It was a lot of information, which is, I cannot even, you know, put my head together. So they were basically explaining that he was right to the kitchen and then straight from the kitchen towards them trying to attack them with a broomstick. Okay, it's a scary thing, maybe, for somebody. And they shot him somehow when he was facing them three times in the back. And this is what autopsy report tells, exactly three times in the back. And it's went through his body, so re it outside of front. <coughs> then three bullets went straight in the left arm. I will show on myself, I don't want to pull each picture and show. It's coming straight to the arm. It's re-entered, two of them re-entered from the arm to the ribs, all the way through the heart aorta, basically, you know, after what happened after this, you're dead right away. It's hidden aorta, so all blood is going right away from the heart. And again, he was right-handed. If he would have carried something in his hand, it would be right hand. Another thing, his bullets went through arm to the body. That means his arm was tied to the body, like this. If he would have keep something or hold something in front of him, there's no way when somebody's shooting you like this, that bullets will come through arm and re-enter to the body, to the heart. There's no way. And all position they describe it there, they saying where who was standing, it's also lie. And because it was uh, uh, redacted, so they put those marks, the, the people didn't know exactly the names. But when it's unredacted, you can see. And that FBI agents give an explanation what he was actually standing when, when my son-in-law was writing that confection. And he says he was on to his left, but his position on the picture set on the, another place, which is my son-in-law was on the right side. So it's every word. Every word is lying in their reports. And I went through all those pages. It's, it's a lot of work. And of course, I don't want to make you too busy with this, all details. But the biggest thing, I know for sure they came to kill him. And this is what I have a proof on the cell phone conversation that was also published with reducted blocks on top of it. But if you will read, the first, I, I believe they needed some kind of excuse or some kind of alibi. So the day on May 22nd, 12 or 3 a.m., a little bit after midnight, a couple minutes before they shot him, they is kind of typing each other, be on guard, sitting in the same apartment in front of my son-in-law who is writing some kind of confession, and they texting each other, be on guard. Okay, so the next two, this is, a, I don't know if you can read, if you can see what it says. I would read just a couple words. Well done this week, man, well done. And at the end, the second message, great work. 
So would you send something like this to your colleague if you fail mission? If something happened what was unexpected, what you actually didn't plan, would you send something like this? So to me, this is a confession that they came to kill him. And they exactly did they supposed to. Because he was a good witness for youngest brother Sarnai, for his trial coming on the 3rd of November. He would have been good support for defense team because he knew so much and that's what they couldn't let him do to speak on the public that's why he did so to my my old point is first of all to me fbi right now it's like ebola so if you touch you come close or you help them you most likely will be dead but i think it's it's even you know in best result i, I hope we bring him in a good spot now better than we are all but if you will stay away, don't let them abuse your rights, don't speak to them, point on your lawyers or grab their uh, business cards to make sure you know who they are. So you can pass it around your friends, your family, to make sure people know about this. This is what we didn't do. So learn our mistakes. We didn't protect ourselves. I didn't protect my son-in-law and my family. We didn't know it can happen that way. So now they're expecting to Conf uh, uh, they, they're trying to uh, convince everyone that Sir Nives did it, even it's a whole bunch of false. Again, if you're interested, you can find this whole information. It's a lot on YouTube, on Facebook, everywhere. A lot of pictures. We're out of time, but thank you a lot. I'm sorry, can I just say a couple words more? Well, I just, just want to say I'm here not just for justice of my son-in-law because I'm fortunate I can't help him anymore. I'm here for everyone who's right now struggling, like families, like your brother, and a lot of other people. In, in, in this, uh, you know, horrible places with tortures, with something what they never done and they've been accused with, and also for Johar Sarnaev and his six friends who's been arrested lately, also for falsifying, falsifying accusation against them. They didn't do nothing wrong. They didn't do anything, but they now in jail, and some of them looking for 25 years in prison just because they know that family very well, because they know they are good people, and they didn't do what they actually blame me on. They didn't bomb the Boston. I just wanted you to hear that, because I, I can speak for that. I can promise what I'm saying is true, and that's why my son-in-law is there. So I just want you to protect yourself, people. Don't trust the FBI. Stay away from them.
uh, sign petitions, to continue to make phone calls, to continue uh, to show up at courthouses, uh, because it's important for us to be there together. It's, it's when they see us together um, that we can, we can change things. Um, there is a very famous quote that comes from a Lutheran pastor um, during the days of Nazi Germany, and he said something like, uh, when they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't say anything because I was not a Catholic. And then they came for the gay people, and I didn't say anything because I was not gay. And so the list goes on and on and on of those who they came for. He said, but then when they came for me, there was no one to speak for me. So it's only when we speak for each other, when we stand together for justice, that we uh, can change things. Um, uh, when you turn light on to the darkness, um, the darkness in our nation uh, has to go away. Um, the, the stories that we've heard about the FBI are not new stories. Um, the, it's the same FBI that was active in Mississippi during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, in Alabama and places all across the South. It's the same FBI. You know, it, it, the people are different, but it's the same FBI. So this is not anything new. For those of us who have gray hair, we remember some of those, those stories, those realities. Um, so... Yes, we've lived them. We've lived them. We've lived them. Um, and the final thing I want to say is, um, those of us who are aware, um, who are educated, who do reach out to hear the stories of what's going on, have a obligation. And that obligation is to tell these stories to other folks who are not aware, because. You know, 99% of folks in this country don't have a clue that this is going on. Uh, and would be very frightened and horrified uh, if they were to know. Um, and then um, finally, to make the connections, to connect the dots. The use of informers is the same thing that is fueling mass incarceration of African Americans all across this nation, and that's been true for the last 25 years. Um, so the use of informers uh, uh, is not anything new. So we have to be able to connect the dots and understand um, that what's going on in terms of mass incarceration, in terms of solitary confinement, is not only um, a solitary confinement of, of Muslims. It's, there are many. It's, how, how many did you did at you? Least 80, at least 80,000. At least 80,000 people in this country are in solitary confinement. That That is a human rights travesty. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, there's lots of work to do. We will keep doing this over and over and over again. This is not the first time we've done this. It's not the last time that we shall do this um, because it's by telling the stories, by educating people, by um, coming together and strengthening each other um, that we can and change things. So thank you for coming and do you want to say the closing word? We have to sing. Oh, we have to sing? Oh, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I'm not going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a song from the past, is what we're going to sing, Ain't Going to Let Nobody Turn Me Around, and a lot of you know that song, and you're going to sing it with us. And Lena L. Arian has agreed to help me lead that. Really? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Really? So this is easy. The words are all the same if people don't know it's very easy song.